Persona social links are some of my favorite parts of the games. There are great character development moments, but they can't all be zingers. This video comes from nothing but a place of love, as I enjoy the Persona and SMT games thoroughly. But with my video talking about the best social links, it would be unfair not to speak about the worst. Being positive all the time is lame. Before we get into the list though, I will have some hot takes now. Haru is the best girl in Persona 5. I am not going to be losing my mind over the teacher romances in the Persona games, and I will not be including any FemC P3P exclusive characters like the Ken Amato romance, though that might be one of the worst experiences in any game. Without any further ado, let's start with... André Laurent Jean Jureau, or Bebe, of the Temperance Arcana, in Persona 3. Bebe is a standout even in the very first game where social links were introduced. That is to say, you can really tell this was their first attempt at social links. Bebe is a foreign exchange student from France who has a passion for sewing. His aunt enabled him to study abroad, but partway through, she passes away, and he is pressured to return to his home country by his uncle. The main sin of Bebe's social link is just how little it deserves your attention as a player. This family squabble, while the loss of a loved one, especially one who supported you, is sad, it doesn't really grip you. It's just so one note and predictable. The main theme of Persona 3, that being death and overcoming hardship, is there, but they really put it on one of the most bland and forgettable characters in all of Persona. Temperance especially is a tarot card symbolizing taking a higher path and staying true to one's life and purpose, but you just spend most of the social link eating sweets and listening to him talk about how awesome Japan is. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd probably sound a lot like him too if I went to Japan, but that just makes it even more cringe. The social link doesn't even have a good payoff since you convince him to create a kimono with his sewing skills to impress his uncle. After all that time spent with him telling him just to get the thing done, he thanks you for spending time with him, and then just leaves. Not that I would know, honestly, since even using a max social link guide on a repeat playthrough, I flat out forgot he even existed, and honestly didn't feel too bad about it. His manner of speech doesn't lend itself to easy reading either. I couldn't imagine the poor soul who had to write this dialogue. Maybe that's why the whole story is just so unsurprising and boring. The Temperance Arcana is a hit or miss for some people, but I don't think you'll see many Bebe fans in the SMT community. Not even the French one. Hisano Kuroda of the Death Arcana in Persona 4, more commonly known as the Old Lady, and that's for a good reason. No one I speak to about Persona 4 cared about this character at all. If you ask any person playing Persona 4 for the first time, assuming they aren't using a guide, they won't be able to max out every single social link. A very large percentage of that base will never have even gotten Hisano past rank 1. What more of an on-the-nose way to represent the death arcana is there than an old woman coping with the death of her husband? Death more commonly represents an end to something, such as a relationship or interest, and leads to an increased sense of self. Such revelations are difficult to face and overcome, and I'm not saying death can't be a part of, well, the death arcana, I'm just saying it could be more interesting than that. If you started yet didn't finish her social link, as many people probably did, the general story is she is a depressed older woman mourning the death of her husband. She killed him. Or so she says. Turns out she only wished for his death. So that was a fucking lie. Hisano's husband had what most can assume to be a form of dementia or Alzheimer's, resulting in severe memory loss that caused him to forget her completely. This was the source of her mental anguish. Boiled down, it is a touching story that some have to face. A condition I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. It's a shame her social link is almost entirely both of you sitting in one place listening to her talk dialogue box after dialogue box. A change in scenery every once in a while can do a lot to differentiate each interaction, but it just all blurs. It doesn't even really matter what you say in response to what she says. I guess in that respect it is completely identical to talking to an old person in real life. <laughs> At one point you have to uncover the old letters Hisano and her husband sent to one another during their youth. And you do that by going to Daidara and selecting the talk command. Are you kidding me? I bet the vast majority of people stopped the social link here alone. This was the only social link in Persona 4 I skipped almost all the dialogue for in my second playthrough. It was just so boring. What could be conveyed in 5 interactions gets stretched out to 10. What makes this lady think she's worth my time over any of the other people in the cast? Now if you'll excuse me, I have envelopes to fold in my room. That sounds like a much better time. Marie, of the Aeon Arcana in Persona 4. First potential controversial addition to the list, but hear me out. By all means, this Arcana fits the themes of the Aeon card well. Birth, rebirth, awakening, liberation of hidden powers, it all makes sense. It just sucks that it's attached to the character so integral to the story of Persona 4 Golden, yet so unlikable. Marie is a teenage girl in the Velvet Room that has no memories of her past. 
Your job through the social link is to try and get her memories back. Or so it seems, as you later find out the important thing to do is to create new memories and not dwell on your past. Sounds good on paper, but it's too bad most of the Link is incredibly unnatural interactions with the main cast of the game, making them uncomfortable and sometimes outright coming across as Marie being rude. She conveys no likable traits at all, but we're supposed to forget about how much Marie sucks because she blushes sometimes. It also doesn't help that every time I want to go into the Velvet Room to fuse some personas, I gotta sit through one of Marie's poems, where she calls me a pathetic clown. I mean, yeah, I hate society as much as the next guy, but we don't have all day. I get the tsundere archetype is popular in anime and Marie fits this trope to a T. It takes so many interactions before you even get to a point where you feel like you got somewhere with her character. And you better get there or else you won't be getting the true ending of the game. Yeah, not only is she a tropey, ham-fisted character, she is integral to the plot of the game and it just assumes you love her to death. If you liked her, you're built different, but I just don't get it. Maybe I have a chip on my shoulder because I'm somewhat of a purist when it comes to the SMT in Persona games, and they've done this before with my favorite SMT game Strange Journey when they added Alex. The true ending of the game was still a blast to experience, don't get me wrong, but the sheer amount of time you spend on Marie and your party proclaiming how much they care about her more than anything is more than a little frustrating. Her extra dungeon is also the most annoying out of all of them. Every interaction with her breaks the pacing of the game and forces you into a side story that you know nothing about other than the game implying, trust us, she's very important and cool. So yeah, not much going for her in my book. Yuki Mishima of the Moon Arcana in Persona 5 Literally the meme of a Discord moderator before it was really a thing. The Moon card represents deception and illusion. Yuki initially starts out as simply a nerdy guy who's passionate about your cause. But slowly, after gaining a little bit of power and deciding who the Phantom Thieves go after in Mementos, he quickly abuses it. At the end of the day, he's a bullied teenager who's grasping at what little accomplishments he had after being put down for most of his life. Bullying can affect many people in horrible ways, but one teenager alone should not be the arbiter of people's futures. Hence, why Yuki quickly descends into trying to ruin people's lives out of jealousy with nothing to go off of but rumors. He straight up takes advantage of the Phantom Thieves and abuses his power to threaten anyone he doesn't like. After facing his shadow and mementos, he changes his ways and solves his personal disputes with the correct courses of action. This confidant could have been somewhat compelling, other than the fact that he legitimately posed a threat to the Phantom Thieves as a whole. His attitude really rubbed me the wrong way. This behavior of initially being thankful only to quickly become a manipulative little bugger is frustrating. Am I really supposed to imagine a world where I wouldn't distance myself as much as possible at best or kick him to the curb at worst for doing the things that he did? He wants to get famous, and that is an enticing dream. I mean, hey, I'm trying my best to get there right now. Please like and subscribe, please, 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 please. please. But taking advantage of the ones who even gave you an opportunity is just sad. Thinking realistically, if you don't get past the point in his social link where you face him in Mementos, the Phantom Thief's PR would be completely done for. He poses more of a threat to you than some of the bosses do. Granted, by the end of the link, he becomes a stand-up guy, helping people around him genuinely, so I can't hate him too much. His personal growth is admirable, but the initial response of someone like him telling you to shut up and do what he says really made me hate this character. The end message almost makes up for all the BS he had to go through when he realizes what being a true hero is makes it kind of cheap that the only reason why he does it is because he changed his heart though. It also helps that his confidant skill is pretty useful too. And for the final choice, Ichiko Oya of the Devil Arcana in Persona 5. Possibly the least controversial addition to the list, but I got some things to say about her. The Devil Tarot card represents seduction by the material world, but also living in fear and domination by luxury. It advises caution in personal and business matters. Keep this in mind. Your first interaction with Oya is her drunk as a skunk alone in a bar, ready to eat up any information you give her so she can write whatever story will sell. It's obvious she hates her job right now, but she feels compelled to stay in the profession of journalism after one of her articles was censored because it exposed Masayoshi Shido. It even resulted in Oya's partner, Keio Murakami, being framed and disappearing. Oya is nobly investigating her partner, but is being completely oppressed by her boss. Society moment. She ends up writing complete garbage just to get by as your average clickbait journalist. After changing her chief's heart and letting her openly investigate, she sees her previous partner had a mental shutdown and is living alone in a mental hospital. After this, she returns to being a truth-telling journalist. Wow. With this, the themes of the Devil Arcana just don't make sense at all. She does not have an overabundance of luxury, nor is she seduced by material gain. 
The Devil Arcana has been getting consistently worse over the course of the games, ever since the absolute king that was President Tanaka. There is absolutely no personal growth really when it comes to her character, and believe me, there is not much going for her. The Devil Arcana could be the most compelling social link there is, and yet it's wasted on a tabloid journalist with less than an interesting story. She became cynical after some time, and then she stopped after you changed her boss's heart. Great. Oya only wrote those articles because she had to, not because she wanted to. She didn't change, her circumstances did. She says she'll work on articles that expose corruption and help the Phantom Thieves PR, but we already have two other confidants that do just that. There really is no reason to talk to her in the first place. Her confidant skills are absolutely worthless too, as they lower the security level, which assuming you aren't playing the game with your eyes closed will never be a problem. The best way to describe this confidant is wasted potential. A journalist chasing the truth isn't a devil arcana theme at all, and she somehow manages to be more useless than any other side character, even a literal child. Well, that finishes my list. Never thought I'd be making one of these types of videos, but I have my fair share of hot takes too, you know. No series is perfect, and sometimes a good way to appreciate the good is to point out the bad. Please, tell me your own personal list in the comment section below, as I'm genuinely interested in seeing the community's general outlook. And while you're down there, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, let me know if you want more of these opinion-based videos. I don't doubt that everyone's list will be vastly different, but that just makes it all the more interesting to see. This was all my opinion, but I hope you enjoyed listening to me rant about fictional characters for a portion of your day. Thanks for coming, and I'll see you in the next Tony For You.